and I am grateful to be with you. Those who speak to you sometimes ask for your prayers to sustain them in their efforts. I ask that of you tonight with a special urgency and for a specific purpose. Years ago, I served as the bishop of a ward composed of young people. Time has wiped away much of what I learned then of their sorrows and mistakes, but I can still see in my mind most of their phases. I meet some of them as I travel about the world. Their phases and their physiques have been changed enough by time that I sometimes stumble trying to remember names. Others I have followed more closely with a chance to know what life has offered them. When I learn of their lives, I am amazed at the variety of their experiences. Each life seems to be unique. About all they have in common, as nearly as I can tell, is that they have been surprised by the pattern of the tests of their faith. The surprise has come because they could not know when the tests would come, what they would be, nor how long they would last. For a few of those, the tests are over. For some of the members of that ward, the tests ended early. I was reminded of one young man the other day. For me, his face will always be young and bright with hope. He left our ward for a mission in Japan. Decades later, I mentioned his name in a talk I gave to a group of Latter-day Saints in Tokyo. After the meeting, a number of members came to me, their faces shining with the brightness that I remember in his face when he returned from his mission. They told me that he was their missionary. If I understood their English, they said that he was the greatest missionary they had ever known. I was released as the bishop when our family was asked to move to another state. I kept enough track of that return missionary to know that he graduated from the university, applied to medical school, and had been accepted. I did not know his plans for the summer before he began medical school, but I am sure that he looked forward with great anticipation to the years stretching ahead. A phone rang where we then lived, and I learned that he had been killed. He and friends had gone to climb a peak in the Wind River Range in the western United States. I was invited to speak at his funeral. I asked some of the young men who had been climbing with him. Friends from our old ward family to meet me at the chapel where the service would begin in a few minutes. We went to a room to be alone. After we had renewed acquaintance, I asked if they would tell me something about our friend's life. I think they knew why. I wished to speak in the funeral about him and his life. They knew how much I admired him. They also knew that I did not, had not seen him nor spoken with him for a number of years. They knew that I wanted to praise him, but that the praise had to be true. They told me this story. They had camped the night in preparation for the ascent to the peak. As they climbed the next day high on the face of the mountain, a storm came upon them. They could not see their way because of the clouds and the storm. Our friend had volunteered to go alone to find the path. He didn't come back. They found later that he had fallen to his death trying to save his friends. Then, without my prompting, they told me of more than his courage. They told me of where he had been on the trail of faith. They said that the night before the climb, while others had talked quietly and prepared for sleep, he had been studying his scriptures and his missionary discussions in Japanese. I suppose that in the time after his mission, he had the trials and temptations that are common to returning missionaries. 
The fact that he applied to medical school makes it clear to me that he thought the tests of life stretched far ahead of him. Yet when life ended, he was ready. I think of him often. A state president who was his friend in youth met me the other day in Virginia. I heard the same sound of love and awe in his voice that I heard from the members in Tokyo and from the fellow mountain climbers. When such a life touches ours, we are never the same again. We want somehow to be as constant in our faith as he was. We want to know the way to endure whatever surprises life may give us, always ready with the power to pass the tests which will come, always faithful, whatever to the tests, to the end, whenever that may come. The Savior has used the word always in two settings which must have caused you to wonder. The first setting is in every sacrament meeting. The word always is used in a covenant, a sacred promise with God which you are making. This is what you hear, read by authorized servants of God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Another setting in which the word always is used is in a commandment. The Lord repeats the command often with only slight variations. Here is one of those variations. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must watch and pray always, lest ye enter into temptation, for Satan desireth to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. You promise always to remember him, and he warns you to pray always. You may have wondered as of I why he used the word always, given the nature of mortality as it weighs upon us. Just think of what will press upon you when this meeting is over, and to be realistic may be pressing into the minds of some of you at this very moment. You will have to get somewhere. You will likely have something to do, or at least you promise to do something, before the night is over. And you may even be thinking about some people you will be with, or that you might like to be with if you could just arrange it. Thoughts like that and many others may be shuttling through your mind now, or they will as soon as you leave. You know from experience how hard it is to think of anything consciously all the time. I asked you to pray for me as we began. Some of you, I don't know how many, took a few seconds or even longer to utter a silent prayer for me and for our time together that we might have the Spirit and that we might be taught. And yet for your prayer to be answered, it will be necessary for you to turn your attention to listening. Even in this meeting or in any service to God, you will not be consciously praying always. So what does the Master mean when he warns us to pray always? I am not wise enough to know all of his purposes in giving us a covenant to always remember him and his warning us to pray always lest we be overcome. But I know one. It is because he knows perfectly the powerful forces which influence us and also what it means to be human. You and I can see acceleration in the two great opposing forces around us. One is the force of righteousness. For instance, Temples of God are being built at a rate across the earth which just a few years ago would have been unthinkable. Missionaries are, are being called in numbers and to new places which change so rapidly that I have learned not to try to give the numbers or the places because my knowledge of the changing facts will have fallen behind the reality and someone will tell me I was wrong. Leaders of nations and opinion makers in the media seemed to see that which was prophesied in the infant days of the church by the Lord 
in these words to the prophet Joseph Smith, and also those to whom these commandments were given might have power to lay the foundation of this church and to bring it forth out of obscurity and out of darkness, the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, which is with which I, the Lord, am well pleased, speaking unto the church collectively and not individually. Even the world can see the emergence of a power beyond what might have been reasonably predicted. Yet few seem to recognize that the power stems not from organization or programs or wealth. Rather, it comes from individual hearts changed by the faith to keep the commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As has always been true, there is an opposing power. It is the power of sin, and it is visibly accelerating. I will not try to bring examples to your minds. The media and what you see in the lives of those around you present you with tragedy enough. And even in your experience, you surely must sense the ominous increase of toleration and even encouragement of the powers of sin to corrupt and torment. More and more we see the reality of the description. Wherefore men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil, that all men might be miserable like unto himself. The Master not only foresees perfectly the growing power of those opposing forces, but what it is like to be mortal. He knows what it is like to have the cares of life press in upon us. He knows that we are to eat bread by the sweat of our brows, and what cares, concerns, and even sorrows come from the command to bring children into the earth. And he knows that both the trials we face and our human powers to deal with them ebb and flow. He knows what it is for a missionary to arrive in a strange country, perhaps try to speak a new language, eat unfamiliar food, work until fatigue almost overwhelms, be rejected often, savor the moments when the miracle of the gospel changing lives occurs, and then return home to face another set of challenges and changes, and he knows how our human powers to cope are not constant. He knows the mistake we can so easily make. It is to underestimate the forces working on us and to rely too much on our human powers. And so he offers us the covenant to always remember him and the warning to pray always so that we will place our reliance on him, our only safety. It is not hard to know what to do. The very difficulty of remembering always and praying always is a needed spur to try harder. The danger lies in delay or drift. Years ago, one of the things we taught the people we met as missionaries was that they must either progress or they would fall back spiritually. We told them it was dangerous to think that they could stand still. I remember as we taught that feeling that it was true, and yet I wondered why it was so. Time has taught me. As the forces around us increase in intensity, whatever spiritual strength was once sufficient will finally not be enough. And whatever growth in spiritual strength we once thought was possible, greater growth will be made available to us. Both the need for spiritual strength and the opportunity to acquire it will increase at rates which we underestimate at our peril. Time has also taught me something about the ebb and flow of our own powers and of how we may not notice that change. At this Christmas time, 
One of our married sons stayed with his wife and baby in our basement guest room. He found there a daily journal I had kept as a young father, not much older than many of you. I had forgotten it was there and what it contained. At our dinner, my son began to recount what he had read there of my experiences with him and his brothers and of my straining to live a little better, to have the atonement work more fully in my life and to become what I needed to be. He had read of my working intensely and praying earnestly into the early hours of one morning. As he spoke, I thought of some of you. You may have come upon your missionary journals, put away in a closet in your home. You may read and feel a shock as you remember how hard you worked, how constantly you thought of the Savior and his sacrifices for you and for those you tried to meet and teach and how fervently and how often you prayed. The shock will come from realizing how much the cares of life have taken you from where you once were so close to always remembering and always praying. My message is a plea, a warning, and a promise. I plead with you to do the simple things with determination which will move you forward spiritually. Start with remembering him. You will remember what you know and what you love. The Savior gave us the scriptures at a price paid by prophets we cannot me measure so that we could know him. Lose yourself in them. Decide now to read more and more effectively than you have ever done before. Just last month, I learned again the power that comes from trying harder to have the scriptures open to our hearts. It began when I noticed the scriptures of a man sitting next to me in a meeting. He was next to me again today. He opened them as the discussion progressed, and I could see that they were marked, as I had done, but with a difference. He had placed colored tags on the edges of the pages, keyed to the colors which he had marked the scriptures on that page. I asked him after the meeting to tell me about what he had done. He showed me the front of his scriptures in which he had placed a typed page. On that page were topics about the gospel, each with a line under it. And he had placed the colored markers on the edge of the scriptures, one color for each topic, so that he could study all the scriptures which were helpful to him on that topic. Within a day, I had purchased this inexpensive set of scriptures. But it took more than a few days and more than a few prayers for me to know the topics which would open the scriptures anew for me. I chose the topics which would teach me of my call to be a witness of Jesus Christ. The first topic, typed on a page which I could change when other topics become the ones that I need to move to, the first topic is the witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only begotten in the flesh, the Lamb. The next is that he is risen. And the third is that he leads his church. Now, I would not urge you to buy a new set of scriptures nor to get colored tags and colored pencils nor to choose the topics which I chose. But I plead with you to return to the scriptures in some way that opens your mind and your heart to be taught. Many of the scriptures have become familiar to us, yet in just the few weeks that I've been working in this new way. What I remember now about the Savior and what I feel about him has been enriched. I began to read with purpose. Perhaps it was because of the Christmas season. Perhaps it was because I wanted always to remember him. But I found myself drawn to the accounts of his birth into mortality. I read again his words spoken to a prophet named Nephi, recorded in the Book of Mormon, familiar to us all. And yet, the words seemed new to me. Behold, I come unto my own, to fulfill all things which I have made known 
under the children of men from the foundation of the world, and to do the will both of the Father and of the Son, of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh. And behold, the time is at hand, and this night shall the sign be given. And it came to pass that the words which came unto Nephi were fulfilled according as they had been spoken. For behold, at the going down of the sun, there was no darkness. And the people began to be astonished because there was no darkness when the night came. And then, because my mind was set to try to know more of him, of the Savior, and because I was reading front to back and everywhere I could go to try to see if I could come to know him and the scriptures could be opened to me, I noticed in my reading another scripture which had somehow never before caught my eye. It is in Zechariah, not a frequent stopping place unless you are on a search. Zechariah prophesies of the second coming of the Savior with these words which were new to me. Speaking of his second coming, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Now we do what you may have done in your families or you may do someday. We have a little family Christmas pageant. It's moved from place to place over the years and uh, we sometimes have nicer costumes than others. We've even had sheepskins at one stage and people crawling around as sheep. One of the children has usually played the part of Samuel, the Lamanite prophet, for telling of the sign of the Savior's birth. This year was our most successful pageant, by the way, at least for Samuel, because at last we succeeded in persuading the people playing the part of the mob not to hit him. In fact, the mob is sitting here, two lovely daughters, and they did not hit him with their tinfoil stones. So this year we were scripturally accurate for the first time. But something else was new for me this year. As we read those uh, scriptures and the words of Samuel, as I had never done before, I felt that I saw in my mind and felt in my heart the fulfillment of Samuel's prophecy that the sun would set without darkness. I saw it at his birth as if I were somewhere among the people in these lands of promise. And I saw it as it will be when he comes to stand in resurrected glory on the Mount of Olives. The darkness is dispelled when the promised Messiah comes with healing in his wings. Knowing how much I need that healing, my heart nearly bursts with joy and love for him at the thought of that light. I believe I will never see white lights at Christmas again or the dawning of a new day as the sun banishes darkness without the sight triggering both a remembrance and love in my heart for him. I have learned from that journey again through the scriptures and my increase in love for him something about always remembering. Fathers and mothers who love their children already know it. I should have known it. It is this. The child may be absent. The cares of the day may be great. Yet love for the child can be ever-present in the heart of the parent, coloring and shaping every word, every act, and every choice. I don't know all that is meant by this passage of Scripture, but at least part of it is about the possibility of a change in our hearts that our love of the Savior might always be there and always be growing. But charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all 
who are true followers of his son Jesus Christ, that you may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified, even as he is pure. Now I also plead with you to be determined to pray with all the energy of your heart that you might have every gift which a loving Heavenly Father knows you must have to serve his Son and to endure against the power of darkness. Just as you can have love in your heart always, your heart can be drawn out in prayer always. You remember that you were promised that very power which can become greater in times of greater need. This is the Master's command through a prophet to his people. Yea, humble yourselves and continue in prayer unto him. Cry unto him when you are in your fields, yea, over all your flocks. Cry unto him in your houses, yea, over all your household, both morning, midday, and evening. Yea, cry unto him against the power of your enemies. Yea, cry unto him against the devil, who is the enemy to all righteousness. Cry unto him over the crops of your fields, that you may prosper in them. Cry over the flocks of your fields, that they may increase. But this is not all. Ye must pour out your souls in your closets and your secret places and in your wilderness. Yea, and when you do not cry unto the Lord, let your hearts be full, drawn out in prayer unto him continually for your welfare and also for the welfare of those who are around you. The Lord has given us touching evidence of the power of such prayers of the heart. You have read in the Book of Mormon of the people of Alma the Elder who would have been destroyed had they prayed openly. And Alma and his people did not raise their voices to the Lord their God, but did pour out their hearts to him. And he didn't know the thoughts of their hearts. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their affliction, saying, Lift up your heads and be of good comfort. For I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage, and I will ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do, that ye may stand as, a wit as witnesses for me hereafter, and that you may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease, and they did submit cheerfully and with patience to the will of the Lord. The Lord hears the prayers of your heart. The feelings of your heart of love for our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son can be constant and so constant that your prayers will ascend always. Some of you, perhaps without thinking of my request that you pray, brought down on all here tonight the blessings of heaven through the feelings, the yearnings of your heart. I must add to my pleading a warning. You have the right and the obligation to choose for yourselves. You can search the scriptures or not. You can choose to work hard enough to ponder and to obey his commandments, that the Holy Ghost can be your companion. Then you will come to know the Savior better and better, and your heart will swell with love for him. Or you can choose to delay. You can choose to drift. Deciding past efforts will be enough for you. My warning is a simple matter of cause and effect. Jesus Christ is the light and the life of the world. If we do not choose to move toward him, we will find that we have moved away. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven, and he that repents not, from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man saith the Lord of hosts. We are promised that if we always remember him and keep his commandments, we will have his spirit to be with us. That light to our feet 
will grow dim if we choose to delay or to drift. There is also a warning for us as we are faced with the choice whether or not to try to harder to have our hearts drawn out in prayer continually to God. Perhaps the thought will come into your mind, it may have already done, that tonight is not the time to begin an earnest effort to pray with more faith. Or the thought may come that prayer is not very important to you. You may know with certainty the source of such thoughts. And now, my beloved brethren, I perceive that ye ponder still in your hearts, and it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. For if ye would hearken unto the Spirit which teacheth a man to pray, ye would know that ye must pray. For the evil spirit teacheth not a man to pray, but teacheth him that he must not pray. But behold, I say unto you that ye must pray always, and not faint, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. Now for the sure promises. First, if you will let your heart be drawn to the Savior, to always remember him, and to our Heavenly Father in prayer, you will have put on spiritual armor. You will be protected against pride, because you will know any success comes not from your human powers. And you will be protected against the thoughts which come rushing in upon us that we are too weak, too inexperienced, too unworthy to do what we are called of God to do to serve and help save his children we can have come into our hearts the reassurance recorded in Moroni. And Christ truly said unto our fathers, If ye have faith, ye can do all things which are expedient unto me. There is another sure promise. It is this, whether or not you choose to keep your covenant to always remember him, he always remembers you. I testify that Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, was and is the only begotten of the Father, the promised Lamb of God. He chose from before the foundations of the earth to be your Savior, my Savior, and the Savior of all we will ever know or meet. I testify that he was resurrected, and that because of his atonement we may be washed clean through our faith to obey the laws and accept the ordinances of the gospel. I testify that through the prophet Joseph Smith, the keys to administer those ordinances were restored, that they are now held by President Gordon B. Hinckley, and that the authority to offer them is here. I promise you that this day you will feel the influence of the Holy Ghost touch your heart as you search the scriptures with new purpose and as you pray earnestly. From that experience, you will this day have the assurance that God lives, that he answers prayers, that Jesus is the living Christ and that he loves you. And you will feel your love for him increase. I promise you, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.